Welcome to the people in the audience today and our viewers at home. My name is Judith Kamalski and together with Mark Kawakami, we're very happy to be your moderators of today's morning session of the opening of the academic year. So today we are officially launching our new strategic program and I can give you a little sneak preview of what we have in store for you today. There will be two panel sessions, discussions, one more around the community aspect of our strategic program, one more about the connections and our partnerships, and we will have two video messages that people have sent to us. As you said, I'm Mark. In the interest of full disclosure, if I abruptly leave the event for any reason, uh, my wife is pregnant. Uh, so if, if I disappear, apologies in advance. Um, but that aside, quick show of hands. How many of you actually understand what the European University of the Netherlands actually means? That's the title of our strategic program. Show of hands in the audience. Okay, a lot of VIPs, a lot of people know. Martin, I see you have raised your hand. Maybe we'll ask the president of the university to come join us a little bit later. But before that, we would like to show you a quick video to show you some of the people behind this strategic program, the efforts that went into it, and some of the intentions behind our new strategic program. Welcome to the European University of the Netherlands, UM Strategic Program 2022-2026, showing you who we are, what we stand for, and what we aim to develop and achieve in the coming period. Learn more about our mission, vision, and Maastricht's university's added value from stakeholders and staff. We are a young and top-rated university at the heart of Europe with an engaged and inclusive academic community, making its mark on the EU region and beyond through practical, problem-based education and first-class research to meet the challenges that society is facing. Check out the interviews with executive and senior staff. For example, with Martin Paul on why UM has a distinct European focus. We hope that this online guide to our strategic program will give you a clear picture of our plans and ambitions for the next few years. Want to see more and navigate your way through the interactive video? Check out our website. Here you can also read and download the full version of the strategic program in PDF format. UM, a European university with a global impact. Before we introduce the panel members to you, today's session is all about connecting the strategic program to what it means to you people in our community. So should you have any questions for the panel members today, feel free to type your, your question in the chat, in the YouTube chat, and Mark and I will pick them up. So over to our panel. It's my honor to introduce to you the man that needs no introduction, RUM president, Martin Pohl. And we also have Katelijn Hassebroek, who, my dear friend, who is an assistant professor uh, on accounting at a school of business and economics. She's researching how to motivate organizational knowledge sharing. Uh, now, more relevant to this event, she is also the chair of the Maastricht Young Academy, uh, my boss in that capacity. We also have Professor Dr. Harold Merkelbach, who is the dean at FBN, our faculty of psychology and neuroscience. He is a legal psychologist, a member of the Dutch Canave, that's the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, he also advises uh, the Dutch Supreme Court, but more relevant to this event, he is also the chair of our task force on sustainable employability. Welcome. And to my right, last but not least, is Laurens Bierens. Laurens is a medicine student, but not only that, he's also studying health law. Not only that, he's also on the Youth Student Forum. And not only that, but he's also on the University Council. Welcome, Laurens is one of those guys. Exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, video? Yeah. So we also have a video prepared, a video message from the president of NVO, which stands for? Sorry, I'm... I'm... Oh, sorry, <laughs> NVO. <laughs> sorry. Um, but he has shared with us a video message because he couldn't be here in person. If we could cut to the video from Marcel Levy, the president of NVO. I think research in um, European countries get increasingly a, a European orientation. Lot of, lots of funding is coming from Europe. 
um, uh, there is lots of uh, uh, European collaboration. So um, I think it is extremely important to focus on the on the European side of research. Um, but uh, having said that, at the same time, the organization of, of, of the scientific research uh, does not always match very well with how Europe is organized. So for example, in the Netherlands, we are very much discipline uh, uh, oriented, organized. Whereas in Europe, that system has completely lost. And uh, uh, most challenges are now societal challenges, um, which are interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. So what does that mean for Maastricht University? Well, the uh, unique focus uh, on being or wanting to be a, a, a European university may be very important to form bridges and to make the link between the European system of research and research funding and the way that's done in the Netherlands. And Maastricht, uh, if they are able to actually to, to fulfill their, their strategy, uh, uh, could, be, could be able to lead the way also for other uh, Dutch universities on, on how we can do this in the best possible way. Okay, leaving aside the conversation that Marcel started about whether academia is a highly competitive sport aside, what Marcel is saying is very interesting. As the president of NVO, he's calling to our attention the difference between the Dutch institutions, the discipline-oriented institutions, versus the European way, which is more interdisciplinary, more societal goals-driven. For example, the Dutch institutions, the faculties, we focus on different faculties. Discipline-oriented is the word that he used. Whereas the European goal is more social, interdisciplinary, mixing of different interdisciplinary faculties. Uh, quick shout out to Valentino Mazzucato's Global Studies Program, which is our interfaculty program. But the vision laid out in our strategic program is a bold, conscious choice that chooses to go beyond the boundaries of the Netherlands, beyond the shackles or the boundaries of disciplines, and figuring out a way for collaborative opportunities and funding to solve societal problems. So with that in mind, we would like to jump into our first question, uh, perhaps starting with Martin, but for everyone else, please think about your answer while Martin's saying, what does the European University of the Netherlands mean to you? What are the benefits? What are the costs, if any, for choosing that choice? Yeah, no, thank you, Mark. I think, uh, uh, as Marcel Levy has said, it's really a commitment that we are a university that's a bit different than other Dutch universities. We have a lot of European students, we have a lot of European faculty, we have a lot of Europe-oriented programs, so it's really calling for our own DNA. And that's the benefit that in a few years we really could, could make, as Marcel said, lead the way also for Dutch university to open up to Europe. What are the risks? The risk is, of course, it's a bold statement and as we all know, internationalization in the Netherlands is sometimes also under pressure, particularly if you think about some parties in Parliament. So uh, the risk is also that we stick our neck out and say we want to be different and that can have consequences. But I believe strongly, together with uh, Rihanna and Nick and the executive board, that it fits well to our history that we always try to be a little bit different and also courageous. So it is a bold choice, a courageous choice. Perhaps moving to Laurence, maybe from a student perspective, what does the European University of the Netherlands mean from your perspective? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think with the Euro European University, we, have, we can interact with so many different cultures and learn from different viewpoints and also learn to communicate. Also see how other people think and react to that. But I think also to recognize each other's strengths and make use of it and in the end make a, improve the overall quality. Very nice. You can see why he's such an accomplished student. Uh, maybe Kathleen, from a researcher's perspective, what does it mean for you? For so for me, it means that we um, actively reach out to others in order to collaborate and to solve societal challenges from a broad and an interdisciplinary perspective. Now, the way um, Mr. Levi talked about that in the video, it sounds like we're not doing that at all yet. I'm not sure whether I agree with that. I think there are many examples actually of Maastricht University already working on and valuing uh, interdisciplinarity. With uh, Maastricht Young Academy, for example, we will hand out an interdisciplinary prize this academic year. But perhaps it's true that those efforts do not translate enough yet in getting those European grants and then putting it a bit more on the agenda can obviously help there. 
One thing to keep in mind, though, is that we are a very uh, diverse and international university. Uh, inclusion is one of our core values. So by explicitly focusing on one, and you could argue still relatively small part of the world, I hope we do not forget about the rest of it. So there uh, should, and I'm sure there still will be room to attract researchers from uh, outside Europe, for example. Uh, example. For international as well. So it's a European University of the Netherlands with a global outlook. Indeed. Got it. Uh, last but not least, Harold, uh, your two cents. Um, I would say that um, there is a, a European intellectual tradition and it, uh, is, it, it, it embraces different values than uh, the American universities. And uh, if, we, if, you, if you look at universities across the world, they try to imitate the American universities. Uh, and what we say here in Maastricht is look at the uh, European intellectual tradition, which stresses cooperation rather than competition, which is topical for the American universities. It stresses global orientation rather than hyper-specialization like the American universities uh, do. And it stresses uh, the growth of knowledge for its own sake rather than the utilian value of uh, uh, knowledge growth. So it's, it's a completely different set of values which we embrace as a European uh, university. And I think they are very important. Yeah. As a closeted American, I really do admire and appreciate the European identity a lot more, that of collaboration as opposed to competition. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, when we read the strategic program, you see references to uh, reward and recognition, to global citizenship, and more broadly, it, it, it gives you a message of we want to be an inclusive and inspiring academic culture. And we're making progress towards that, but we're also encountering obstacles as we move towards that. And we were thinking about this, Mark and I, and we thought maybe that is because it also comes at a cost. There's benefits, but there's also costs involved. So the question we wanted to ask the panel today is, how do we move towards that, but at the same time protecting our people in terms of workload, in terms of stress that we add? Um, and I wanted to go to you, Laurens, uh, for the first person to answer this question. What is that like for, from a student perspective? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very, very good point to, to focus on because with our ambition there also comes pressure and I think nowadays the existing societal pressure is real with not being able to have study financing anymore but also the focus on good grades, uh, to have a board experience and that all within three years while living in the new city, city making new friends, um, facing for the first time setbacks, facing for the first time independence and I think that's all while trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be and what you, you want to accomplish. So I think it's the university's responsibility to be aware of that, to give room to develop where students want to develop and when students want to, to improve or to be broader extracurricular. And I think the, the, the responsibility of the university is um, to help make an informed decision, to, to be critical about the choices that students make, but to empower them. Thank you. That's very clear. Katlijn, do you see the same responsibility when it comes to protecting our researchers and our staff? Yes, yes, of course. And I do think uh, you mentioned uh, r and recognition and reward, that there's really an important role for that in the European University. Um, there's room for um, teamwork, for academic citizenship, uh, valorization is explicitly acknowledged. From a junior perspective, though, I do feel that we have to be a bit careful there because it seems like some people think that r and is about adding more boxes that we then all have to tick. Um, this analogy of ticking boxes is probably uh, not the right one, but it's more about the fact that the boxes I need to tick are different from the one Mark needs to tick. Um, and the way I sometimes see it currently being implemented, I wonder about work pressure uh, indeed. Um, and of course, this whole new idea of R&R requires uh, a big change, um, but I do think the time has come to be a bit bold and to rethink some fundamental aspects of uh, academia. Another nice example of that is the way in which we organize the academic year. So uh, the Young Academies are starting a campaign today for a smarter academic year, which essentially boils down to a, a shorter teaching year so that there's more room for other things like um, research, but also to just uh, yeah relax sometimes a bit, right? Um, but I'm actually sure that in the uh, strategic program as it's lying there now, there's room for all of that and we can be uh, a bit bold and change those things. Thank you, Katlijn. It's good to hear that we're bold. It's the second time we hear that today, and it's very good. I wonder if we're checking boxes by moderating this event. Is, do you think that would be... No, I'm sorry. Just kidding. 
Harald, um, and from your perspective as the head of the Sustainable Employability Task Force, how do you see protecting our people? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. It's an interesting question and it's uh, difficult to answer. But um, uh, Mark brought up the, um, the point of uh, uh, top sports and uh, you know um, NBO has this magazine and in the summer they had a special about uh, the relationship between science and top sports. Top sports as a metaphor for science. The idea being that you have to put all your life 24 hours a day into your science and otherwise you cannot become a good scholar. That is again a topical American idea. And I think it's a wrong idea, and uh, I think we should uh, start with uh, socializing our young scholars in a different way, pointing out to them that it is a very uh, stupid idea to, to think in terms of top sports, uh, because we know that from research, the very good scholars are not spending 24 hours a day into their uh, field of science. They are broadly sampling different domains of life. Uh, look at the Nobel Prize winners. Uh, most of them play music instruments. Most of them write poetry or are amateur actors, things like that. So, and that's what is bringing their inspiration. That's what, where they take their inspiration f uh, from for their uh, uh, field of science. So I think that is very important that we try to provide different models than top sports to our young people, our young scholars. And, and my uh, uh, metaphor is uh, the orchestra playing together, team science. It's a far better model than the top sports model. So the vibe I get from your answers is it's, it's uh, bold, it's challenging, but it's now is the time. We want to do this as, yeah. a, as a community. Thank you. We're going to leave Martin out of that one. Um, I think this question... I was just going to say, oh, please, being no. the president is also an amateur actor, right? <laughs> it's a lot of showmanship, a lot of pretending to be happy when... When you're actually happy. When you're actually happy, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the question that I would like, I will save for myself until later, because now we get to ask uh, the questions that the audience, the online audience who's watching has been submitting. Uh, I have a screen here in front of me with one of the questions from the audience. Should have brought my glasses. Uh, this question is for President Martin Paul. Uh, who will be the new rector that replaces <laughs> Rihanna Letcher? Any, any questions, uh, any answers? Uh, any uh, rector in Bochum, I can answer. In yeah, Bochum, uh, oh. Uh, 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 in Maastricht, uh, mostly. Oh, any, uh, any hints? I Just think, between us. I think universities also need secrets, so that keeps our attention span, right? Particularly yours. <laughs> the suspense, keep the <laughs> excitement. Okay, so no answer. We'll check back in later. Uh, the actual question, <clears throat> sorry, that was mine. Um, it says from the audience, what is new about the theme European University? We already are the European University. No. Uh, so, Mr. Well, President. Well, I think it, it, it's, it's coming back to a point I very often make, become who you are, but that means also you take on a special responsibility. And I think what uh, uh, the community has done, because it's a community-based program, a collective dream, if you want, is to really to formulate what that means for the future. It means something for us as an organization. It also uh, means something for us, what we strive to be in, in the next year in the Dutch context, in the, in the, in the national context. And it also means connecting. Yeah, you, you talked about interdisciplinarity. If you look at, the, of course, European activities that we have in the past, they were a bit scattered around. And what was tried with this program to make paint a comprehensive picture of that, that we can show and uh, project to the outside and that can develop further. I think that's the big difference. It's a difference from being a university with many European highlines or a university in Europe to really reflect upon what European university means. And what said earlier, by no means it's a university that only deals with Europe and thinks about Europe. It thinks about the world, about the region, about our local environment with the expertise from European traditions and many uh, people who work on, on European issues. I think that's the big difference for me. We're also getting questions around the top sport analogy, um, not surprisingly. So this question will be for you, Harald. Um, science is hopefully not a top sport, giving your life completely to it, but being completely exhausted after 10 or 15 years. Um, and there's so much wrong with this analogy. So I think we're getting some, some 
remarks from the audience that say they agree. <laughs> they agree yeah, they very agree. much. Uh, yeah, basically this colleague agrees with yeah, that is, with what that you've is been the saying. wrong uh, analogy, the wrong metaphor. Yeah. 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 So let's look for different types of metaphors. Yeah. And I think one way we could facilitate creating a university orchestra would be something like what Katlai mentioned, the interdisciplinary prize yeah. or these incentives. Yeah, going across uh, the disciplines and, and thinking in terms of team science uh, rather than being a, the senior author of a paper or the single author of a paper. Yeah, yeah. And Katlai, does that resonate with you, that metaphor of the orchestra playing together? Would that fit better in your view? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely, yeah. Totally agree with that. Very good. And what instrument would you be playing in the orchestra? Okay, I stop <laughs> asking these questions. Sorry. And Lawrence, from a student's perspective, I mean, you're the shining example once again, right? You're an FHML student, you're a law student, you're doing university council. How does this play into the student's life? Yeah, I think I agree with that top spot shouldn't be an analogy that's used in the academic world, also as a student. Um, because I hear the, the words relaxing, the words socializing, and I think studying is so much more than only being, than just being a student. I think that should be the emphasis, that your study life also um, develops you as a character, as a, pers as a person. And that's not only the study you're studying at that time. I think that is one of the advantages that UM, but also UFA gives to our students, that if you have a curiosity that goes broader than your own curriculum, than your own discipline, then we have the opportunities, for example, within a UCM. I think that are the great, great aspects. Great answer. Um, just to be very blunt, we would love to continue this discussion for hours, days, uh, but we have a very limited amount of time. Maybe that's just me. Um, so I guess we have to move on to the final question of yes. the first panel. Yes. And as a final question, we would like to ask the same question to all our guests today. Um, it's a little bit of a dream question, an aspirational question. So if you think about UM in 2026, what will life be like? What will we be like? And we've asked all the panelists to think about a one-liner to give us their view on what that will be like. So I would like to start with Katlijn. Katlijn, what is your vision on life at UM in 2026? So in uh, 2026, I hope we will be working smart um, while playing also hard. I hope there's actually some room for the latter as well. And for that, uh, getting back to the, the bolt uh, that, that came across already a few times, um, yeah, we might need some uh, out with the old, in with the bold. And I don't mean that literally, of course, but I think, um, yeah, some, some boldness would be appreciated. Out with the old, in with the bold. I completely concur. Laurens, what is your view? I like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, what I see as a, I see an international university that empowers the curiosity of both students and staff to do what they want, um, but will con still continue to be, to, f to feel like the best choice for me as a hopefully future alumni. Very good. Alt, I turn to you. Yeah, I'm very bad at one line. <laughs> let me, is, let me start with a nightmare. What is a nightmare? A nightmare is what I heard from people um, at uh, law schools of the Ivy League universities in the United States, where half of them are on sleep medication or on antidepressive medication, and that is the nightmare. And so what is the dream? The dream is a truly European university, but with a strong sense of caring for each other and a strong sense of community. Yeah. Very good. And we're saving Martin for last, so he will be the last one-liner, so he has a little bit more time to think. Yeah, but he, but he said my line. What am I, no. <laughs> I mean, first, uh, first, I want to make a statement. I'm very sympathetic for personal reasons that top sport is not uh, needed here, because then I would be losing out. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, what, we, what we need to be, or what my dream would be, that we are in six years a really true community where we don't only care for each other, but also project the sense of a, a, a community based on European tradition and European s uh, spirit to the outside of the university, across the walls of the university, because I think the society needs some healing powers to really also be brought together again, not only in the Netherlands. I, I really want to keep this going. Yeah, me too. Do, do you think we can squeeze in one more? No. Well, if you think we can. We're going to squeeze in one more question just because I see it in front of my screen and I don't want to disappoint our online audience. Again, thank you for watching. Um, this is, again, a current events. It's uh, directed at uh, Harold in the Volkskrant. Our rector was recently in 
Uh, Rihanna Letcher talked about a possible Vitus staking. Stocking. Backing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> European <laughs> University, Vitus stocking yes. this weekend. Is that to be expected? Real quickly, what is a Vitus stocking? Anyone? Yeah. It is you don't completely stop working. It's not uh, you don't drop everything, but you just respect normal working hours. So you start at nine o'clock and you finish at five and you just do what you're supposed to do in that time. But you don't do any over hours anymore instead of a regular strike where you just drop everything. Any comment on, on Yeah, I think the idea is very interesting, especially as also a signal to the politicians who are currently trying to make this a new government. And um, they don't realize um, that uh, science and, and the universities play an extremely important role in our society. Look at the pandemic and the solutions to the pandemic and what science and the universities contributed to that. But somehow the politicians underestimate that and we are underfunded as universities. So in that sense, I think that it is a very good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry to squeeze one in. I hope the audience online uh, is satisfied with the uh, question. If you haven't well, read the Volkskrant article, highly recommend it. It's in Dutch. <clears throat> um, but with that, we conclude the first panel. Uh, our thanks to the panelists. Uh, and we now have exactly 14 seconds to switch panel one members with panel two members. Martin, please stay. Ready? 14 thanks seconds. Go. Welcome back. Uh, so in our first panel discussion, we talked about our community and the effects that the strategic program will have on the UM community. And now we're broadening our view and we're more talking about connections, connections that our community has with the outside world. And I'm very happy to introduce our panelists for this round. The first one being Astrid Bouye. Astrid Bouye is the CEO of the Brightland Smart Services Campus, which is a triple helix innovation campus in Heerle around the topic of data science and artificial intelligence. And there are 80 companies, governments, startups, knowledge institutions there, one of which is my very own BIS Institute, so we work together very much. And I wanted to say I can tell you from my own experience that it's Astrid's go-get attitude that recently led to us being uh, recognized as the Brightlands AI Hub, one of the seven national hubs in the Netherlands. In addition to Astrid, I'm very happy to welcome Helen Mertens. Helen Mertens is the CEO and chairman of the executive board of Maastricht UMC Plus, our hospital. And as such, she feels responsible for the health of the people in our region. And not only by treating them or diagnosing them, but also looking in a broader sense to what kind of other social factors might play a role. And I read some of your interviews online and I'm quoting, but paraphrasing in English, that you said, by being open to each other's ideas and collaboration, we can implement the good stuff. So we're very happy to have you here today. The good stuff. The good stuff. What was it in Dutch? Uh, the goede dingen. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, for the third panel member, someone who just came from Croatia, we have Professor Dr. Snejana Prijic Samarja. I practiced. Perfect. Uh, from the <laughs> University of Rijeka. She is the rector there, but not only that, she's a full professor in the Department of Philosophy. Just a comp I have to read from my notes because you're also the member of the Governing Council for the Drafting of the European University Association Strategy. You're also a member of the Steering Committee for Education Policy and Practice at the Council of Europe. Do you have any free time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking from the panel one, give me a um, So very welcome to, uh, to be, we're very happy that you're here in Maastricht with us. Uh, and also Martin will also be joining us for this panel. Um, perhaps we could move on. We also have a surprise for everybody, as you said in the beginning, we have received a video from the European Commissioner of Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, and you've, that's a lot. <laughs> Her name is Dr. Maria Gabrielle, and she sends us this message, bearing in mind she is also the key person that is implementing the Horizon Europe program. So without further ado, a video from Dr. Commissioner Maria Gabrielle. Dear Rector, dear professors, Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this new academic year, 
I would like to send you a message of encouragement and support. The Maastricht University is a learning community that we should be proud of. Since your foundation in 1976, you have embodied dynamism, innovation and excellence. You are deeply embedded in your region and beyond, hosting a student body that represents the diversity of Europe. Nowhere is this more evident than in your leadership in UFE, the Alliance of Young Universities for the Future of Europe. You are pushing the boundaries of our knowledge, seeking solutions for the challenges our societies face. But you are doing it with students in mind, first and foremost. For example, I'm very proud of the youth student journey, your initiative giving your students the possibility of enriching their degrees with courses from any of your partner universities. And your youth diploma supplement will be especially valuable, guaranteeing that students' efforts are recognized. I'm also enthusiastic about the Youth Star system. We know that there is so much to gain from activities like mobility, learning languages, not to mention professional or civic engagement. Each of these four activities rightly represents a star, and I'm proud to see your efforts to actively encourage and recognize them. All these efforts, together with the work of the other 283 universities in the European Universities Initiative, will help us pave the way to success, pave the way to a higher education community that works transnationally to address our difficult challenges like climate change or COVID-19 recovery. To back you, we have the brand New Erasmus Plus and Horizon Europe programs. Both contribute to student and staff mobility, bringing on cooperation between you and our innovation ecosystems. Indeed, our programs have this challenge approach in mind too. Erasmus will be more inclusive, more digital and greener, mirroring our greatest education challenges. And Horizon, of course, has its missions from fighting cancer to healing our oceans. You can count on our commitment to back you. Our universities are the masters of their own fate, and we want to empower your voice as we map our future together. Thank you for leading by example and have a great new academic year. So we heard from Maria Gabriel about one of UM's strategic partnerships, which is UFA, Young Universities for the Future of Europe. Um, Partnerships are crucial to the new strategic program because we cannot do this alone. And those bold ambitions that we were talking about, we need our partners to achieve that. So we're very happy to have this second panel discussion with some of these crucial partners who will be instrumental in bringing us forward. Um, and my first question is about the respective partnerships that we have as UM with all of you. Um, what do you see as the benefits of that partnership with UM and the costs of that partnership? And if you could give us one concrete example to make it really come to life for the audience, that would be a really nice addition. So I'd like to start with Astrid. What are the benefits and the cost of your collaboration with UM? Well, Maastricht University for our campus is one of the most important strategic uh, partners. And more than that, uh, together with the other knowledge institutions at our campus, they are the brains of our campus. And for Maastricht uh, University, of course, uh, BIS, but also uh, the, the Institution of Knowledge, the Department of Knowledge uh, in Engineering, is a really important uh, player in our campus. And together, they are in almost all of the projects that we do together. Uh, with other partners, with companies, with governments. And an important example, a very recent example, is the ELSA lab that we have uh, developed together. It's a lab on the ethical, uh, legal and societal aspects of data science and AI in the field of poverty and debt. So socially very relevant and we couldn't have done it without Maastricht University playing this very important role. 
And looking forward, of course, the next step is uh, data science and AI has links with all fields in society and economy. And you see that ref reflected in the university where it plays a role in all the faculties. And the next step now, in my uh, view, would be to bundle it and to, to free up capacity to really strategically take this step forward and developing Limburg into a national and even European player in the field of data science and economy and AI, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I recognize that and I'm very happy to be a part of that, especially the Elsa Lab. I find that a very exciting development. Um, let me turn to you, Helen. What is that like for the collaboration between the UM and the hospital? What do you see as challenges and costs and what is a good example of what that brings? Yeah, that collaboration is very, very important for both organizations, I think. And we have a lot of challenges, believe me, but we also have benefits. And the Maastricht University Medical Center is already a successful collaboration. We work, but we have to extend it as much. And not only in the medical field, but also in uh, technology and science, for example, huh? we can, can extend all that collaboration. And we have to focus, I think, in the next future, we have to focus and uh, to uh, uh, con uh, connect our strategic uh, choices, our strategy. And in the new program, there are a lot of, lot of possibilities that can help both organizations. Because we have the same goal. We work for uh, our well-being, our global health, regional health, and then we only can do it when we do it together. That's a possibility to do reach the goal. So for us, the collaboration is very, very important. I mean, if I could just add a personal thank you, because I've been at the hospital quite a bit lately mm -hmm. and very appreciative of the, the support and the care that we get. Um, we're very lucky to have that partnership. Thank you. Yeah. And I hear the word connection come up a lot. It's connecting disciplines, connecting the, the different partners. What is that like in the UFA initiative, Snijana? Is, is, what do you see as challenges? What do you see as benefits? And what is your example? Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for the question. At first, allow me to say that I felt definitely very much privileged on the opportunity to be here at the opening with you on behalf of the UFA Alliance and definitely to wish to all of you at the U University of Maastricht, you know, the happy uh, anniversary, actually, you know, this 45th anniversary. Uh, yes, we are very happy. We are proud member of the Youth Alliance, Alliance of 10 universities and four non-academic institutions. And the partnership with the University of Maastricht is really precious for us. Astrid said that the University of Maastricht is brain of, of, of this partnership. And I, I will also repeat that and say that it's not only brain, but the heart of our alliance. You know, So officially, you know, informally literary uh, coordination is here at, at the University of Maastricht but fantastic leadership, allow me, Martin, of the, this fantastic leadership of the Martin Paul and really the, the, the people here at the Maastricht is really amazing for all of us. The UFE, UFE is a project, is the strategic project for, of course, Maria Gabriel said, for all the Europe, but also for us there. We would like, you know, to bridge all these gaps between the citizens, uh, science, community, universities, gap the bridges between the Europe, EU13, EU15, and we really believe, believe strongly in that challenges and the benefits you mentioned. Challenges, of course, this is the transformational agenda for the European higher education and science, and definitely it's an institutional change for all of us, you know, to be one strong European universities made of 10 universities. So this is really a challenge. But on the other side, the benefits, a lot of benefits. To participate as the young universities in the project to build the future, the future of Europe, the future uh, with, with all these European values. This is the really benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very convincing benefits. Martin, how do you see partnerships and the role for partnerships for the UN? Well, I think it's an important one and we have a big tradition in that uh, field. Uh, I think it's very important that you find like-minded spirits if you are on this kind of voyage uh, into the future. It's not only important for making plans and thinking about how we can position ourselves in an increasingly global context. It also is to help each other and to support each other. You know, the subtitle of our program, it's, a, it's called a caring university. Huh? And we also have to care for our students and our staff in a time of crisis. Huh? We, had, we had the COVID crisis still going on. And, and before, 
uh, I, I, we give the impression here that we're in some alternate uh, universe, we saw everything is wonderful and perfect. It's been extremely helpful to have these networks and these partners to, to really debate and discuss how we can handle these issues. So it's not only... I would say the shiny, bright perspective of a joint future of connectivity. It's also learning from each other, holding each other's hand, which helps us to make us stronger to the outside, but also to the inside in our community. I'm really glad you mentioned the subtitle of the program. So the strategic program is called the European University of the Netherlands, a caring and sustainable university. And when I was reading through it, um, I saw there were so many good ambitions and good aspirations in the in the program. We want to be the European University of the Netherlands, but we also want to be uh, promoting regional and international progress. We want to be caring with attention for work-life balance, for reward and recognition. We want to be sustainable by 2030. We want to focus on the SDGs. We want to be an open and diverse, uh, inclusive academic community. Uh, but it did make me wonder, um, a strategy is also about what you don't want to be and what you uh, choose to leave behind or put aside. So I was wondering, were there things that were considered but that we decided to let, let pass us by that we don't want to become, Martin? Yes, I mean, first of all, it's maybe good to understand that this is not a, a strategic program that has been written by the executive board. It's a strategic program where we, we went out to, to the university and did lots of interviews, and this is what we got back. So we have to conclude that there are a lot of different ideas, a lot of visions in the university that we try to con uh, incorporate. That's why it's such a potpourri. I think the, uh, the task of the future uh, will be, there's also no checklist huh, that you mentioned, that we do this this and this, is what you prioritize from it. And that, again, needs to be a discussion process with uh, uh, the organization and with the stakeholders. And so I think uh, there will be some priority. And it will be, again, something we plan together. But I think it's important to set down, the, I would call it, the collective stream of the organization. That's what, what really you put to paper. And what we don't want to do, I think that's my personal opinion, you don't want to be a copycat of other Dutch universities. So which means, I, I, and of course I'm no longer responsible here, but my colleagues and the new rector, whoever that will be, uh, certainly will, will, will uh, also try to, to live this further, that we want to be a little different. So I think we don't do uh, classical new disciplines that we add on or... Uh, things that are already existing at other universities, that is something we, in my view, we should not do, because then you really don't add anything to the community uh, in the Netherlands of Dutch universities or European universities. I think that's the one sort of what, what you just listed off. When I first read the strategic program, it, I was skeptical, because it just seemed like we're trying to do a million things. But I think upon reading through it and understanding the key, key stakeholder involvements, it's all interconnected, right? Because in order to be a good educator, you need the good research. In order to care about the people within our community, we need to sort of expand our circle of empathy to external partners as well. So it's not this, this, and this. It's the whole holistic perspective. This is what we're doing. We are the European University of the Netherlands. I think that was the spirit Yes, and if I, sorry if I'm taking your time, but if I may add on, and this was something that actually came from the discussions with, for example, the University Council, with the deans, and that's also in this, in this program uh, uh, very prominently present, is that the most important part of a strategy of a university is the human capital, the people. Yeah. And, and this was something we really got from, from these discussions, and we put it very prominently down. So for any online audience members who still have sort of lingering concerns, we hope that this segment has sort of strengthened your belief in the strategic program. Um, but shall we move on to some yeah. of the audience questions? Or the interdisciplinary one? Oh, well, I guess if I may interject then, the audience members will have to wait because I want to squeeze in a question yeah. as well. Um, this is something that Harold touched upon earlier, but the idea of interdisciplinarity. The strategic program mentions quite a bit uh, about how do we achieve it. Sometimes we use the word transdisciplinarity. Um, not really sure exactly what that is, but the question that I have to the panel members is, what is the role of interdisciplinarity in solving some of our key societal problems? I think some hints to the answers have already been sprinkled throughout, but if we could offer some key benefits to 
interdisciplinarity. What Marcel Levy said, we need, if you want to be a European university, we need to move away from the discipline-oriented structures. We need to be more interdisciplinary. What does that mean to you? How do we achieve it? What are some of the problems that are associated with it? Uh, if we can start with Astrid. Yeah, thank you. It's a very relevant question. And I think also interdisciplinarity is about relevance. All large transitions that we are going uh, through right now, from sustainability to the healthcare uh, issues that we are facing, uh, to the housing crisis in the Netherlands, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are all interdisciplinary. Uh, so it's not uh, a matter of doing it because Europe says we need to be interdisciplinary. It's because every question that we are facing right now has an interdisciplinary aspect. And of course, this also helps uh, ed educating students uh, to put them in interdisciplinary context that they will later on focus uh, a, a face in their working lives. So it's relevant for research and also relevant for education, in my view. And you see that reflected in the field of data science and AI, which plays a role in all of these questions. And we are always in teams uh, with people from all kinds of uh, disciplines. It's beautiful. Um, moving over to Helen, perhaps. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Marcel Levy, with, uh, with Astrid. I think interdisciplinarity is very, very important and one of the keys for solutions for many, many things, I think. When we uh, look back to the COVID crisis, for example, uh, also we have seen that that transformation and transformation in the healthcare program, transformation in all economic uh, uh, key issues, I think interdisciplinarity will help us to solve problems else also. And that's the reason also why the circle between for example, healthcare professionals, but uh, researchers, uh, evaluations of innovations and things like that. And also education, uh, that has to be uh, closed, connected in the circle. Uh, and then we can move on and go to solve the problems we have. It's beautiful. And Snejana, last but not least. Uh, thank you. Interesting question. And I know why you actually ask us about that, because there is a lot of debate in the uh, scientific uh, community, you know, debates, uh, dis disciplinarity versus interdisciplinarity or multi or cross or transdisciplinarity. But I think actually that it is the false dilemma, because it seems to me, of course, we are scientists. We would like, you know, to, to, dip, uh, to dig deeply, you know, we, we need the disciplinary uh, framework for our analytical and research purposes. But the real world is not disciplinary, you know, this, this would be definitely, you know, artificial, uh, the, the problem, the, the situation are completely interdisciplinary. So as well as I think that this dilemma, fundamental versus applied sciences, artificial or false dilemma, I also think that this is a false dilemma. There is no alternative for problem solution uh, uh, than to be interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, intersectional, you know, to cooperate together, not only between us, between disciplinary, but also between sectors, because we are here, of course, because of the community, because of the quality of life and work of our people. Um, so that's... I'm just curious, because Martin mentioned earlier that his role as a president, soon to be rector, <clears throat> it, it's not just about being a president as such, it, it, you need some theater. You need to sort of, it's, it's about management skills. It's about assortment of things. Your background is in philosophy. Do you find that your background in philosophy has contributed in some way to your job as the rector or all the membership with these task forces that you have with the Council of Europe or, or something along those lines? Yeah, probably it could sound, you know, uh, surprisingly, but definitely it helped me a lot, you know, all these skills, analytical skills, you know, working with the concepts, debates, you know, but I'm sure that also from the different areas, you know, to be, we are not trained to be managers here in the higher education and science, you know, so we try, you know, to, to understand the other, other discipline, other sectors, and definitely we try to, to build, you know, our competences as best as we, as we can, but as I said before, you know, the real world world is definitely interdisciplinary. Our work is definitely interdisciplinary. We are researching disciplines, our disciplines, but definitely we live the collaboration interdisciplinarity. Oh, 
That's beautiful. So if I understood correctly, and maybe I'm aggressively paraphrasing your answers, but Martin, I see the dean of the six faculties sitting here. Do we just get rid of their jobs and just combine one faculty, one UM? Is that what interdisciplinarity means? No, exactly not. And that, that, uh, I'm glad you asked me this question, which was not prearranged, by the way. Sorry. Uh, that uh, right. in order to be interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, you have to have strong disciplines first. Mm -hmm. yeah, otherwise, it, it, it's a bit fake. Uh, so you can only do this if you have very, you know, if you, for example, one of the things we are uh, intensively debating, and it's also in the program, that we need to, to, to really bring science, engineering, and medicine and health closer together. But you can only do this in a true interdisciplinary spirit if you have strong disciplinary identities that you bring together. That, that's really the, the advantage. You cannot build up interdisciplinary research without having this discipline. So I think the deans can be uh, relaxing and... Uh, they will be allowed to stay, yeah. For at least and, until uh, your as, as, a fun, as a fun fact, as a fun fact, in my new place, I have to deal with 21 deans, so uh, I'm, uh, that will be the challenge. <laughs> Good luck with, with that. I, I mean, I like to think, Harold mentioned earlier, an orchestra, but I also think about it in terms of jazz music, improv. You can't just improv without learning how to play the instruments quite well, and you have to interact with other musicians. You need to learn the skills first before you can improv or be interdisciplinary. That's it. I think it's time that we go to the audience questions yes. again. And there's one very persistent question that keeps coming back. Any news on the new rector yet since the last time we checked with you? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the only person who's not involved in that process, so I can't give you any news. <laughs> we'll keep trying to get the scoop in our morning session. That yeah, is our but, aim. But I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay, point taken. Let's go to a first serious question from the audience. Um, and it is one for Astrid in first instance. So we have these campuses, four Brightlands campuses, and we want to be the European University of the Netherlands. Should we then make the campuses? is more European. What is your view on that? Well, I think that uh, the four campuses, they are increasingly becoming European. They are in international collaborations, all of them already, many of them. And they are also increasingly looking into European grant programs, etc., etc. If I talk from my field, uh, the, the European Union is heavily focusing on uh, data science and artificially intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence as a means to solve the societal issues that we are fa facing right now. And they take a European viewpoint on, on this, uh, namely the human-centric uh, uh, version of data science and artificial intelligence. So this is a huge incentive for us to, uh, even further than we do not right now, collaborate in uh, European uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, so I think the campuses are, uh, from, a, uh, uh, from the, an aspect of valorization, are a great basis for Maastricht University to even further expand its European collaborations than it already has and does. Maybe, maybe somewhere in Croatia, perhaps. Yeah. For example, yeah. Of course, why <laughs> not? Because we yeah. are together, actually, you know, in the Youth, uh, Youth Alliance, and actually one of our flagship uh, in the Youth Alliance is virtual campus. So we have already been connected in one very, very big virtual campus of... 200,000 people actually there. So we have the student portal. We communicate with each other. We share our, our courses. So this is really European, you know, when we are talking about European University of Netherlands, but also, you know, uh, about European universities of future. Yeah. There's another question coming in. Um, and it's someone from the audience who says, Martin, they actually agree with you that strong disciplines is definitely very important. But is there a need, in your view, to break the walls between disciplines? Yeah, I mean, the question is what breaking the walls means. I think we need a lot more dialogue, you know, and, and uh, one of the, the uh, key experiences I had when, when uh, my colleague, I think it was Nick, proposed we should invite people from the organization to have a typical Dutch uh, brochures lunch. Huh? You know what that means, uh, particularly with milk and, and, and water. And which was quite interesting uh, because we did it in a randomized way alphabetically. Huh? So unless people were married, they came from all different faculties and was quite interested 
that uh, uh, some people worked on the same subject from a different discipline and didn't know each other, although they have been working here for 10 years. So I think uh, breaking walls, if that means connecting, uh, creating uh, spaces where we can use co-creation, and I think the Brightlands Campus is actually one of these spaces, will be very important because uh, I, I myself from medicine and the big danger of, of, of being uh, strong in this discipline, of course, these are only the people you know, you feel safe there. It also means that you step out of your comfort zone. And I think it's the role of the university to create these spaces where this can happen. I mean, I suppose the one way to do it is, as we mentioned earlier with Katlin, just these incentives, right? So we make some funding available to incentivize inter disciplinary interfaculty collaborations. Um, and we have done so. We have yeah. done so, uh, uh, for example, a few years ago with programs where we connected universities by funding uh, joint efforts. And some of these actually went on. They become Brightlands activities and got external funding. So it's definitely something that, that brings people together money. But I think it should be more than that. And Helen, how do you see the role of different disciplines in preparing doctors for the future of medicine? I think. We still know with all the disciplines, eh, all the examinations are within disciplines, but I think that will will going to change in a couple of years. And uh, uh, only uh, it's it's uh, important uh, to have more connection and to, to work together. And of course, it's on our responsibility to uh, let people meet and also uh, meet and greet and uh, and find out researchers with clinicians and, and, and other examples. Uh, so that brings us further and they understand each other well. Last question. Are Last there? question. Same as the first panel, if you could give us a one-liner, a short sentence mm -hmm. or so, uh, about what you see your partnership looking like in 2026. In ideal scenario or not, what does your partnership with the UM look like in 2026? Starting with Astrid. Yeah, for me, my dream would uh, be to have a continued strong partnership in which we together, uh, we help uh, Limburg position itself in the field of data science and artificial intelligence. And so uh, that's also attracting and retaining talent uh, to our region and also uh, to support the uh, regional economy. Beautiful. Helen, over to you. Yeah, 2026 is, is really close, but uh, that is not a really uh, easy question. <laughs> uh, I already met, mentioned a successful uh, partnership with the Maastricht University Medical Center, and I think in a couple of years we will have much more partnerships within the two organizations, but even much more organizations around us, and that's, that's my dream, and I think we are working hard uh, uh, on that. Nejana, I mean, I, I'm imagining visiting Croatia, really, but... Uh. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually, we live in very, very challenging, new, brave pandemic or post-pandemic world. So I'm definitely sure that we together in UFA with University of Maastricht and our other partners, definitely we, we in this world of, let us say, alternative facts, skepticism towards science, uh, echo chambers, a culture of ignorance, that we will be the new uh, power, new European power, you know, in building really European values and identity of the harmony, of peace, of enlightenment. So definitely I see us in 2026 as you uh, really, really power uh, 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 in that sense, universities for, for definitely for enlightenment. Beautiful. And we asked you to wait, Martin, until panel number two. What would your one-liner be, UM 2026? Well, I think we have achieved something when in 2026, the people of this university have said this program was more than a shiny, glossy, commercially uh, piece of work. If they have really lived this uh, in a way and said this is also part of us, because it was written with the community. And I think if in six years the community uh, can look back and said, we went on this voyage together, students, staff, whoever, and they said, we achieved this together, that would be, I think, wonderful. Beautiful. Um, 
That brings us, unfortunately, to the end and the closure and the wrapping up of this event. Um, so there's first a few people I'd like to thank. Of course, the people who contributed to the strategic program, those of the community who've been interviewed, those who have produced it, who wrote it, and uh, who've helped us prepare for today. The organizers of today, such a well-prepared event. And most importantly, all our panel members. Thank you for being here today with us to discuss this. And also the thanks to the audience here uh, and to those watching online. Uh, a very special thanks to Martin Paul, our president. This is your last morning session for the opening of the academic year. Um, you left us with a hell of a strategic program. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to get prematurely sentimental uh, about your departure and all the things, the wonderful things that you've done for the university. So instead of that, I'll just announce that your farewell lecture is on the 7th of October, right here. If, so please sign up. But for everyone, please go read the strategic program. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went in. I have a black eye. That's unrelated. Um, and it's a very cool document once you get to read through it and understand what we're trying to do. Um, with that, uh, maybe one last one-liner from Judith, from you. Yeah, well, I thought everything's been said by now, so I draw my inspiration for my one-liner from one of the world's biggest thinkers, Yoda. And I say, bring disciplines together, we must. Benefit society, we will. Uh, for, for me, wow, in 2026, I would like the UM to be a place where people want to be. Because we're investing in good, caring people solving societal problems. And we continue to display collective resilience through adversity and manifest the courage to keep growing. So very easy, attainable goals. Uh, with that, we thank you uh, once again. Thank you, everybody. And hereby close the opening of the academic year 2021, the morning session. Thank you very much.